Allow me to introduce you, uh, Reverend Professor Milan Georgievich, uh, from the Faculty of Orthodox Theology, St. Clement of Ohrid in uh, Skopje, Macedonia, who will um, talk us about his country's experience. Please, Father Milan, and thank you very much for also co-organizing and co-hosting this uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, the introductory notice. And especially thank you for everything you said. Like it was very interesting to hear this um, this part where you spoke about uh, sola scientia and this parallel with the uh, Protestant Reformation and this issue about the way we interpret the this uh, subject of the uh, of the sola that should be one. Yeah, the way we interpret the Bible in the one case and the way we interpret, interpret the uh, scientific uh, results of the scientific fraud process on the other hand. So this distinction helps uh, a lot. And um, I may begin with uh, responding to one, uh, to one uh, part of your, uh, uh, of your paper where you said, uh, that the public uh, opinion in Greece uh, in relation to these uh, uh, movements that were against the measures and the vaccination, et cetera, they all, you, you told something like this, that they all referred to the lack of enlightenment of, of this, um, uh, that Greece missed the enlightenment period in the history and now we have uh, the Greek people didn't go through the enlightenment and therefore Greece and uh, the Greek. Uh, uh, it is the narrative, not my opinion, just to clarify. Yes, 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 uh, certainly. But uh, uh, this is the opinion of, 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 the, of, of this side, of the uh, Sola uh, Scientia side, let's say, who uh, interpret it in the way that there was no enlightenment in Greece and therefore we have these consequences. We have so many anti-vaxxers and so many uh, movements uh, around the church, etc., cetera, were against the science as we interpret it. So, you know, the, uh, it, uh, uh, in our context, it is a bit different. So the argument uh, of this uh, side would be a bit different because and this side looks the enlightenment period in the Yugoslav times. So it is connected with one nostalgia. They say, oh, the beautiful times of the Yugoslav enlightenment. I paraphrase, I paraphrase. So they have a point in history to which they can refer with uh, nostalgia and uh, build their animosity to the other side and build they, their own uh, ideological narrative through this to this uh, point, and I think that this principle uh, would work for any post-socialist uh, uh, country in the region. Uh, I can I can guess more or less. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would say this is our experience. And uh, now, how this uh, this antagonism functioned? in our context. I, I, uh, I don't have the pretensions to, to be very original. I will just try to highlight a couple of points that may be interesting for us in this respect. So, uh, and I would divide these points in two groups. The, the points where I can say that uh, the religion acts or the religious way of thinking, the religious way of thinking acts like a superior to science, and then the opposite, uh, the opposite uh, uh, phenomenon, the, the opposite process. So in the beginning of the pandemic, maybe during the first year of the pandemic, uh, maybe the first direction was uh, more obvious or more dominant. Mm. Uh, two questions were raised, were opened. The question of the way how to um, practice the Holy Communion, on one hand, I think that every 
Orthodox uh, community had to deal with this question, the great question about the one spoon. Yeah. And then there was another interesting context because there is a, a, a number, a, a large uh, Muslim majority uh, in Macedonia. Uh, uh, they have also, they had, uh, they opened, uh, there was a, an issue open which refers to them as well. And that was the issue of the iftar uh, dinners during the Ramazan Lent. So I will try to refer to, to both of them because it, 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 uh, it was, uh, uh, this may be the two uh, highlighted religious motives which were most brought to the fore into the public space and into the media as well. So the question about the uh, uh, um, communion and way uh, to practice the communion, we could see, and to practice the liturgy in general, we could see different uh, approaches to this question in different countries from the disinfection, etc. You know, this sanitary approach on the one hand to <clears throat> the restrictive approach where there were some, uh, uh, we could see also, for example, into some of the parishes in Western Europe, in the, I think in the, in the some of the Greek parishes in, this, in the Western Europe, there was, uh, the, the believers were asked not to take the communion, they can come to the, uh, to the uh, service in a small number, but to abstain from taking the communion. Uh, I see that Sotiris uh, uh, doesn't know about this, but uh, uh, communities which I know personally, uh, in Germany had uh, this practice. And the first practice with the sanitarization, et cetera, is uh, more used by the Russian. Uh, church. And uh, what is our example? Practically, there were, uh, there were no, uh, I would say there were no uh, changes into the practice. But, uh, but still, th there was something changed. Uh, the church didn't change anything, and the state didn't change anything inside the way the church uh, uh, practiced the uh, services and the liturgy and the communion, etc. But uh, during the first months of the pandemic, there were very strict measures in the country, including a curfew, and nobody was allowed to get out of home in certain periods. Exactly these periods were the periods when there were the, uh, the church uh, services. <laughs> so practically we had the right, the priests had the right to go to the church, with the singer and uh, the altar boy <laughs> and to make the service alone because nobody else would come in this period because nobody was allowed to go out of home. So, uh, you know, this was uh, kind of, uh, I, I actually I find it kind of a Byzantine way of uh, solving the problem because the church didn't do anything. They just continued practicing the thing. And then the state didn't mess in the church work in the way the church works, but they uh, cut something else. They cut the times when the people can go out. So the problem was solved. <laughs> uh, mm, not really for long because uh, this uh, restrictive period uh, was uh, maybe three or four months long, around three months and then everything went back to normal, to some way of normal. Everybody was uh, left on his personal conscience to take care. But uh, it is a fact that in this period, especially uh, around the, the uh, uh, just a second. around certain, uh, um, just a second, please.
around resurrection, uh, there was a really huge uh, media uh, mm, uh, exploitation of the topic about the one spoon, etc. So it was really a huge topic. And then uh, the second point I mentioned, it is the practicing in the Islam, the Iftar dinner. Uh, um, it was after the Great Land and after the um, after the uh, after the uh, feast of the resurrection. Uh, so uh, there was a, a famous famous uh, statement of the leader of the Islamic community in Macedonia who said. Uh, uh, at some point in May, it was in this period, he said, now the corona is died, close quotation. And uh, then everybody just completely relaxed about the whole thing with the pandemic. And then we had, uh, the, then there were some, not only because of the uh, Iftar, uh, gatherings and uh, Ramadan celebrations, but also about because of the whole uh, relaxing of the protective measures, there was an increased number of uh, COVID cases during the summer, which was not the case with other countries in the region. Um, I think that the biggest problem in this period were actually the restrictions, because uh, the restrictive measures didn't allow uh, any awareness among the people to be built. So at the moment when the restrictive measure stopped, uh, everybody just tried to go back to normality. And then we had this summer peak, which was unusual for the other countries in the region in 2020. So uh, we were almost all isolated. It was very difficult to travel in this period. Um, after this, there was a peak in autumn 2020, which is much higher. And then there were many fatal cases, also among some among the clergy. And uh, after this, the church engaged more uh, and uh, called for uh, protective measures. Before that, there were calls, but there were more official calls, calls like, uh, please take care for the uh, close ones and uh, wear a mask and etc. But after this, there were more uh, engaged uh, um, appearances of uh, uh, church officials who uh, supported the measures in this period. So what happened after this? We had the spring 2021. And here something changed. Uh, um, the topic about the immunization became uh, very exploited. Everybody, all media started talking about the immunization and everybody started arguing with the so-called anti-vaxxers who were against immunization, etc. cetera. Uh, there was something strange in this situation because on the one, one hand, you could hear the voices telling, don't believe the anti-vaxxers, uh, take your jab. But there was another voice, which was actually the problem. And the, the other voice said, there are no any jabs here. We don't have any vaccines. So we had the full scale pro-vaccine propaganda on one hand and uh, absence of uh, vaccines until middle summer. It was quite late. Many people went to other countries to take their vaccine in this period. Uh, and uh, this reminded me to, 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 to one uh, interesting uh, point uh, that uh, uh, Slavoj Žižek gives. And uh, that is that uh, one of the distinctive marks of one uh, functional ideological system is to include within it contradictory messages and uh, point out some impossible demands. So this period of a couple of months from February to June 2021 was a period of impossible demands because there were no vaccines. 
they would take your take your vaccine, but nobody could not take the vaccine because we didn't have any vaccines uh, here. Um, so um, uh, at this point, uh, what Sotir is told about this religious or I would call it ideological appro approach to science uh, became more and more obvious. Uh, so. The first, uh, the first part, part uh, 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 everything I said before, was the way uh, um, the religion tried to deal with the problem of science, of the virus, of the protection, etc. And now we have the opposite, the opposite idea of an ideology that identifies itself as scientific. Uh, and acts as superior to other opinions, including scientific and religious opinions. Uh, or what Sotir is uh, uh, named as way to mediate, to interpret the scientific facts and information. And when you say, for example, some scientific information are still missing, then you are uh, automatically excluded from the official group, from the group which is part of this ideological system, which functions as an ideological system. Mm. The vaccine became kind of a cre uh, credo. Uh, it was missing, but the uh, it was oath, it was expected from the people to confess it. You don't have the vaccine, but it is enough to confess it and to say it is. Uh, we are on the right side, yeah. And uh, mm, uh, any suspicious scientific behavior, I will call it suspicious uh, behavior, scientific behavior, uh, questioning of actual measures and their effectiveness was being isolated from the public discourse or, or simply ignored. And I will give an example. Uh, for example, uh, it's not connected to the immunization. It's, it's not directly connected to the immunizations, uh, to, to the immunization, but the, those who were recovered from the COVID-19, uh, mm, didn't have the same rights as those who uh, got the vaccine. And there were people from the uh, university professors and scientists who claimed and who guaranteed that those people should have the same rights as those who were uh, uh, immunized to a vaccine, but they only had the right to have a COVID pass for 45 days and not for a longer period. Mm, so th this was a very practical issue. Why should somebody who has gone through the COVID and who, who has the antibodies, etc., cetera, uh, have less rights than a person who got a shot or two shots of, the, uh, of some of the COVID vaccines? Uh, and uh, there was another period in the autumn 2021, and it is very strange the number of the people uh, of the registered cases of COVID-19 was very extremely low. And the medical workers had full hands of people who were COVID positive. So what was the problem? The problem was that uh, uh, there were not enough tests for those people to test and to prove they have uh, they are positive. And accidentally in this period, we had census and elections. So uh, these two things coincide, coincided, the census and elections on the one hand, uh, local elections, and on the other hand, the disappearance of the, of the tests and disappearance of the possibility to prove that somebody is positive. positive. Uh, all these events, and many more which I cannot mention right now, uh, uh, made the people lose uh, their 
uh, fate is not the right word, but <laughs> lose their fate uh, in the uh, authorities who managed the uh, pandemic. The number of the people who deny the immunization and the vaccine and the virus itself, etc., is quite low. But there is a number of people who do not accept such a way of managing of uh, uh, the whole situation, which go out of the uh, of the uh, endurances of the uh, competences of the sciences and of the uh, scientific uh, boards which have to manage the whole situation. I will finish with three points which are not original at all. I just, uh, uh, they're connected, the three of them are connected to, to already mentioned uh, uh, Slovene philosopher. But I think that these three points that come from him, uh, from uh, Zizek can be, can help us uh, put some light on this uh, strange situation, at least we are going through for the last two years. Uh, first, uh, Zizek has one very interesting idea about uh, uh, the faith as a founding exception of rationality. The rationality best based on itself leads to nihilism. It cannot stand by itself. And it's not his idea. It is, uh, he, he himself quotes Chesterton about this in one of his books. And I think that this is one of the points we can refer to when thinking about the reasons for uh, all this uh, uh, situation. Because if you try to found the rationality on rationality or to found the science as a science, then inevitably it seems that you go to building an ideological system. Uh, this is the one point. Connecting to it, uh, if you build such a system, it has some creed, it has some, um, some uh, orthodoxy. And in this case, it repeats the dogma about the human deprivation of any universal transcendent meaning. This one of the points uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, Sotiris mentioned Harari. This is one of the uh, points with which uh, I also strongly disagree with Harari because he tries to watch the whole thing in strictly immanent terms. It tries to uh, reduce the humanity only to the horizontal of uh, human existence, uh, mm, renewing the dualist idea of the uh, material body as the one and only reality in which we exist. And uh, in this way, the human attention is being, uh, mm, in our context, in our context of the contemporary media, media which manage the public opinion about the pandemic, etc. cetera, uh, the human attention is being dispersed to as many imminent uh, ideas and interpretations as possible. And in the same time to as many truths and interpretations as possible. So even if you defend the scientific truth, you treat it as if it is, it is only an ideological one because the context in which you do that is uh, the context of the contemporary media and the context of the social networks and the context of Google, where it is the secondary, uh, it is not the most important what is truth, but what will the public opinion about this truth? Will this product sell or not? How many clicks will you get? So in one context like this, where you one media like the uh, uh, like uh, Google, for example, where you uh, where the criteria you get the information is not if this is truth, but how many clicks the, the, do you have here? Uh, then uh, uh, first, there is a high possibility, many uh, non-scientific uh, truths or interpretations will come to the fore. Many people will accept them, but there is much worse temptation to present the scientific truth and one of those many truths. And then to ask yourself, 
Why doesn't anybody believe the scientific truth? Sorry, the media is wrong. And the way we present this truth, the scientific truth, and the way we treat it uh, seems uh, to be the problem and not the truth itself. And uh, at the end, a third point, which I uh, thought of uh, when trying to connect uh, Zizek and our topic, is the um, topic about cynicism. Uh, the force that puts uh, one ideological mechanism into motion is the uh, cynicism, Zizek would say. Uh, the temptation to question the motives that stand even behind the most obvious and proven truth to that extent that any notion of truth deems or fades out behind the assumed uh, motives. So what is the most important are the motives and not the very content. So we try to judge the content through the motives. It's not important if two plus two is four. It's important, it's important what are your motives that you state that two plus two is four. Uh, and uh, with other words, truth is being subordinated to justification or accusation of different motives to their exposing or excluding from the public space. Everything I said doesn't mean that truth does not exist. Everything I said, on the contrary, uh, everything I said doesn't mean that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is not a problem and it is just uh, something that, uh, that there is a conspiracy behind it, etc. No. What I want to say is that the way we manage it, and especially in our local context, the way we manage it in our local concept, context were, was deeply wrong. And I think that there, there is place space for parallels between what I have said about the motives and uh, the uh, other things I mentioned on the one hand, and what uh, we heard in the previous uh, uh, paper, uh, the previous exposition about uh, the problem of mediating the truth and the way of we interpret it in our, our context. So thank you. I think it was understandable. Like maybe it was a bit, uh, uh, it was not structured so much like uh, like a, like a paper, but I think that I uh, I connected. I, I try. I I, uh, I uh, managed to connect the experiences I wanted to share with you with some of the conclusions I uh, draw. I have drawn from them, and I think that these are not the final conclusions, but I think that uh, there are, that. Uh, that we can question some of these final marks, remarks I have given and uh, come to more precise uh, points and conclusions. So thank you. Many thanks, uh, Father Milen. Um, if I may say two uh, comments, first of all, that uh, there is a consensus, as it seems, as to the problem of uh, science becoming a religion in the public square during the pandemic. And by the way, you mentioned truth. From the very moment that science is relayed in the public square as the bearer of truth, capital T, quasi-metaphysical truth, obviously we have a huge gap between science and scientism. I, I very much enjoyed, I must say, the, the comment about, are you with the vaccines or against the vaccines? We don't have any vaccines, but you must clarify, you must profess whether you are in favor or not. And the last point is, in seeing all this in a theological manner, it's interesting how there is a certain atonement, ras ransom theology. While the manufacturers of the vaccines never said, you know, you will take one jab and COVID will belong to the past. The politicians did say one thing. In Greece, it was said explicitly, the vaccine will liberate us, but it will liberate us from what? From the, not only from COVID, but also from the measures restricting freedom in the public square, etc. So it, it is an atonement theology. Um, is there any other? Ah, Alexandro wants to comment. And at, uh, in five minutes, uh, we can uh, proceed to the next paper.
I wanted to to add to what uh, Father Milan said, and you, Soteris, commented on the fact that uh, people were asking uh, this sort of uh, uh, of confession of the vaccine creed in the abs absence of the actual vaccine, and and I guess this is one of my points as well because uh, I think that if we try to and I'm coming back to the thing where like people, you know, so some blame orthodoxy as a cultural framework for the fact that there is so much uh, opposition to vaccination in uh, orthodox countries. If we, uh, uh, if we um, uh, ignore the specific case of Greece, we will probably get a, get a much significantly lower uh, rate of vaccination. But I, uh, this is what I'm saying, and what Father Milan said, I mean, this is a problem how like modernity and modernization is manifested in these, these societies. Because you have, for example, I guess it's the same uh, in, in, in your countries as well. You have somewhat of a middle class, you know, uh, which is not, not very much, not, not a big part of society. I mean, it's like, a, a, like rather a limited percentage of, of the population, a middle class, which is Western educated, uh, um, you know, earns, uh, you know, a little bit more money, have the possibility to travel and stuff like that. And uh, on the other hand, you have like a high, uh, high poverty uh, rates and a lot of people who are essentially outside of the infrastructure and benefits of modernity who don't really have access to vaccines or to a proper health system or to a proper education system and stuff like that. And whenever we are facing such a conflict in our societies in Eastern Europe, we get these people who are the rather privileged minor minority who start lecturing the others, who are asking for, from them a sort of like commitment to modernity and to Western science and to liberal values and to vaccine and to being cool and to being like, you know, outside and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, uh, those people are, are uh, many of them are reluctant to believe in that because they don't really come into like material objective con contact with those benefits. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, of the fact how uh, vaccination, uh, um, pro-vaccination com campaigns have been made by the government in Romania and with the, you know, with a contribution like in uh, in uh, you know publicity made by uh, some well-known uh, actors or musicians or like uh, social media whatever stuff like that and all of these people were like basically like middle class people but in Romania the middle class is like about 15 percent and who are saying like what does the vaccine mean for you and all of these people are saying like most of them the vaccine means for me to to be able to travel again to be able to go on vacation again to be able to fly again to go on a city break but the reality of the fact is that 60% of, of Romanians can't afford to travel because they're too poor and they don't like, and they like say, what does the vaccine mean like to travel? But I never travel. I mean, what, it doesn't mean anything, anything to me in that case. And uh, the thing is that uh, many, for example, like in villages, I, I, I have friends who told me, you know, we have like a quite significant percentage of rural population is that those people out there, although Romania, like Macedonia, had the vaccines from the early spring, and you know, we're in the EU, and we were like a bit, little bit more ad advantaged from this point of view. The thing is, is that in those areas, I mean, you could go to the city to get a vaccine, or you know, there were like clinics and stuff like that. But mm, there, there are like a lot of elderly people who like their kids are uh, abroad or, you know, and if, if those kids didn't tell them, I got vaccinated, you vaccinate, nobody else, and they didn't because nobody actually came from the state to talk with them, you know, like from like doctors, was like somebody to explain to them. I mean, those people were saying, oh, you know, vaccines exist in Romania, it's better than in Macedonia. Uh, it's your, uh, we told you on TV to get one, it's your, uh, it's your obligation to get one. So I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking that basically, you know, there's this, this sort of, uh, you know, start like we we're, were like, uh, want to, to have ideological modernization, but don't we don't really have like the basic infrastructure of modernity. That's it. Thank you very much.